think about man-made machines, it's very hard to name one that doesn't eventually go wrong. Uh, toaster ovens catch on fire and burn down lovely homes. Uh, automobiles, which are amongst the most widely used means of transportation, break down on a regular basis. Commercial airliners are perhaps the safest means of transportation that exist. And yet a major commercial airliner vanished this past year. We still have no idea where it is. One of the most sophisticated planes that Boeing has ever built. Now when one of these machines goes wrong, and tragically wrong, there's a limit to the scope of the tragedy. Uh, when an airliner goes down because of some mechanical glitch, the victims are the passengers and the loss is felt by their families. That's a tragedy, but it, it, it's limited to a few hundred or a few thousand people. And I bring up these issues in designing machines effectively because nuclear weapons are machines. They are the most dangerous machines ever invented, and they don't exist in isolation. They're connected to other machines, like missiles, bombers, which are connected to other machines, communications systems. And what you get is an incredibly complex technological system. And one of the realizations I came to during the research on my book is that human beings are much better at creating complex technological systems than we are at controlling them or understanding them or knowing what to do about them when something goes wrong. And by control them, I don't mean through diplomacy, arms control talks. I mean literally control these weapons. Make sure that they don't detonate by accident. Make sure that they can't be sabotaged or stolen, or used by one of our own officers without the permission of the President of the United States. It's remarkable when you look closely at this history how difficult it's been to control our arsenal for almost 70 years. And I interviewed people who were in charge of our nuclear command and control system. They were well-intended, they were patriotic, and yet they themselves felt throughout the Cold War that this enormous system was always just on the verge of slipping outside of anyone's control with potentially catastrophic effects. One hydrogen bomb dropped on the Capitol building in Washington would kill everybody in Washington, D.C., everybody in Baltimore, the entire population of Philadelphia, and half the population of New York City. One nuclear weapon. There had been studies done in the late 1940s at the Pentagon that were trying to figure out, well, how many nuclear weapons do we need to hit the Soviet Union with in order to destroy it permanently as a functioning society? And those studies calculated perhaps 150 to 200 atomic bombs, like the kind that destroyed Hiroshima, a fraction of the power of hydrogen bombs. So in around 1948, we thought we needed 150 to 200. And yet 20 years later, less than 20 years later, we had 32,000. I spoke to former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who was head of the Pentagon when our arsenal reached its peak. And I asked him, how is it possible that you thought you needed 150 to 200 and you wound up with 32,000, most of them vastly more powerful than the type that you only thought you needed 150 of? And he said, well, Eric, if you want to understand the nuclear arms race that we had with the Soviet Union, this is pretty much how it worked. Each step seemed perfectly logical at the time. 
and step by step by step led to a place of total madness. Now, once you have 32,000 nuclear weapons, it is an extraordinary challenge just to know where they all are. Uh, if you're running uh, a large electronics warehouse and you have 32,000 flat screen TVs and you lose 10 of them to theft, you're doing an incredibly good job of inventory control. But with nuclear weapons, you can't afford to lose one of them, let alone 10 of them. So for the management managers of the American nuclear arsenal, this was a constant struggle to know where our weapons are, who's got them, and what they might be used for. Not long after the Kennedy administration took office, we had a hydrogen bomb fall from a bomber accidentally that nearly destroyed uh, the state of North Carolina. And it would have put radioactive fallout all the way up to Washington, D.C., just a few days after John F. Kennedy's inauguration. I write about accidents in which uh, uh, a workman is trying to repair an intruder alarm at a missile site, and he opens the fuse box. He, basically, the burglar alarm isn't working properly, and he's pulling out one fuse after another, and he's using a screwdriver instead of a fuse puller, and he pulls out a fuse, and he's very surprised by the very loud explosion that he hears when he pulls out a fuse. And what he had done is created a short circuit that launched the warhead off the top of a missile. And the warhead didn't detonate, but it could have. I interviewed top Pentagon officials. I interviewed weapons designers. I interviewed bomber pilots, missile crews, nuclear weapons repairmen. And again and again, I heard from them, it's almost miraculous, that no city has been destroyed by a nuclear weapon since Nagasaki in 1945. They cannot believe it hasn't happened. If you read the paper, you can read about what's been happening with the American arsenal just in the last year. Missile officers caught using illegal drugs. Missile officers caught cheating on proficiency exams and trading the answers to exams via text message, essentially sending classified information over unsecured uh, communication systems. Uh, missile uh, blast doors that won't close. Aging computers. And I'm very critical of the management of the American arsenal, but allow me to be jingoistic for a second. We invented this technology. We perfected it. We have more experience dealing with this technology than any other nation. And if we have come this close again and again to blowing ourselves up. Think about other countries that don't have the same technological proficiency, that are seeking these machines. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, having spent now seven years immersed in this subject, I don't feel apocalyptic. I don't think we're doomed. But I'm very, very concerned.